Welcome everyone to It Tastes Different Gaming News, IDT. That's where you're at. So, the topics we're going to talk about this week, this is the news from last week today. And those topics are Final Fantasy XIV Community, pays respect to Berserk creator Kentaro Mura, probably butchered the name, but that's what it, that's, that's the best I can do for it. Uh, Xbox Secret Easter Egg. What is it? We'll tell you. Zelda Skyward Sword Fast Travel locked behind a, an amiibo? And Starfield Xbox PC exclusive somewhat confirmed. All right. Well, let's start with, uh, we'll go ahead and start with the Final Fantasy XIV. So, uh, the creator of Berserk, an anime, uh, a really good anime out there, and uh, the creator, Kentaro Mura, uh, recently passed away. Uh, he apparently passed away from an acute discretion or dissection, sorry. Um, that is basically like a, a rip in your blood vessel that goes to your heart. And uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. And he was only 54. Now, most people... You know, it's usually something that can occur on people older than that. So it's kind of a rare thing for him at 54 to have something like that. But, you know, things can happen. But the cool thing about it is, you know, he influenced a lot of different games and kind of had his own perception, uh, you know, his own influence in a lot of games like from Dark Souls to Final Fantasy, and, you know, had a creative touch in these uh, games and impacted them in certain ways. And I'm sure he's uh, impacted a lot of other games as well. But what's really cool is that the Final Fantasy XIV community had a heartfelt video uh, online that paid tribute to Mura and Berserk, showing off, uh, you know, how much they meant to him uh, with that Berserk manga series and, and anime series that he had. So, uh, you know, the video is out there. You can go look it up and go to YouTube and, and search for the Final Fantasy XIV uh, tribute. But it's really cool. You know, even Yoshi P, the the uh, director of Final Fantasy XIV, commented on, you know, the tribute as well as his death, saying that, you know, it's unconscionable, you know, basically just flabbergasted by the fact that he died. Uh, but, you know, that's really cool to see the community come together to pay tribute to a great, um, you know, artist and creator uh, as that of the creator of Berserk. But so that's really cool. It's a really cool thing to see. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm really happy to see communities come together like that, especially online communities and pay tribute to those you know, uh, creators as well as, you know, this we've seen stuff like this in the past with even players having stuff like that. You know, even like in uh, Elder Scrolls and stuff like uh, or World of Warcraft, you know, they built that one statue for that one person. I, I can't remember that story off the top of my head, but there's a lot of that stuff going along. So it's really cool to see that community, but uh, come together for that. So, Patrick, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Uh, the community kind of come together and what do you think about uh the berserk creators uh uh the death yeah that's pretty cool it's always great to see communities come together when when tragedy strikes i mean that is a that is a very young age i mean 54 is not that old and it's not that far off from most of us and i'm like that's just insane when you think about it but stuff happens and people die young unfortunately um but it's great to see the community come together I know the only thing that I didn't really know his influence in gaming was so big. I know him from the manga and the anime. Um, it's kind of bad and sad because the manga is not wrapped up. So I, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, he left an unfinished series. You know, I'm pretty sure he thought he just like everybody else did. He's still young. He's got plenty of time to finish this up. So, you know, he left the manga unfinished, you know, so it's going to be it's going to be. um I hope they try to finish it. I don't know how it would be hard to finish if you weren't the original creator. You know, I'm sure he had ideas and uh, pathways he wanted to pursue with the manga. And then eventually they would adapt into the anime. But I like the anime. I watched the anime, the um, the, diff the three different series for it. Um, so and then, like I said, I, I didn't read the manga, but I knew they were making more manga. So I'm like, well, there's going to be more anime. So I'm happy, you know. Uh, but it sucks. It really does. I mean, he, I guess he had a larger influence than I even knew about. Like I said, I knew he was huge in the manga series and the anime series stuff, but didn't know his stuff crossed over into video games. I'm going to have to look up and mourn how his influence was and how his influence spread to video games because I was, didn't even know he had video game influence. 
Yeah. And I wonder if he had like some, you know, if he was brought in for creative, um, you know, differences in, in different games, you know, or uh, creative aspects and stuff like that, you know, um, or maybe even worked on some, you know, maybe did some of the, they do have berserk video games. So maybe he had some influence on those and how they, you know, their direction and stuff and art style and various, various things like that. So, but yeah, I mean, that really sucks. You know, he's, that's a berserk's a great anime. It's a, I've never read the manga either. I've seen some of the anime though, but uh, I'm sure it's a great manga series. And, uh, you know, it sucks having creators like that uh, pass away early, you know, cause then you know, what, what would happen to berserk or, or maybe he goes off to make some other new, uh, you know, manga or anime that's really great. You know, we'll never, we'll never know now. So, but right. yeah. unfinished work, yeah. unfortunately, you know, I mean, he leaves behind a, he leaves behind some big shoes for somebody to fill if they're going to attempt to um, wrap that one up. I don't know how they're going to do it, yeah, but I wish anyone luck who wants to try to finish that one up. They got some huge shoes to fill. You know, I mean, it's been going for a while with the manga has, so it's. It's it's sad news for sure. And unfortunately, you know, his fans are going to his fans have basically lost him. He's been running this manga since like 89, I think Eight, late 80s, early 90s, something like that. So, I mean, it's a long running series. Uh, and, it, you know, it's just it's really sad news and, you know, wish his family condolences and hopefully somebody picks up and continues with his legacy. Indeed. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on from that to Xbox's secret Easter egg. So there's two different. So apparently there is an Easter egg on the, uh, the original Xbox that uh, no one has ever found. And so it's been 20 years and uh, one of the uh, dashboard developers uh, basically decided, well, since no one's figured this out, let me go ahead and just spill the beans on it. So there's apparently two ways you can get this Easter egg. Yeah, uh, one of the ways is by uh, if you go to the audio CD ripping screen, and you can name a new rip "Eggs Box," like eggs, like Easter eggs, and then as soon as you hit done, this will immediately trigger a hidden credits roll. So this is a, a credit roll for the the apparently for the dashboard team. That's a hidden credit roll that credits a lot of people, and you can uh, uh, do this by by ripping a CD and calling it eggs box. Uh, and there's another way you can do it too. And then I'll let Patrick, I think you have that one pulled up as far as uh, the Timmy portion, but I'll let you uh, talk about that one, but uh, how to trigger that one. That one's a little, that one's a little long winded. <laughs> there's a lot more yeah. to do than just ripping a CD and calling it eggs box. Yep. Uh, but yeah, that was the, the eggs box I think was the original one. The newly discovered one is the one where you boot up the Xbox, the dashboard, and you go in like the music selection, like Nick was saying. This one, you insert audio CD and copy it twice and then select new soundtrack. Name the new soundtrack, Timmy, with a bunch of Y's and exclamation point and wait for it to finish. Then you basically go back to the dashboard, go to settings and head into the system info page. It says there should now be a new listing uh, called the Xbox dashboard team. So, you know, a new little hidden Easter eggs. There's there's tons of little things like developers, uh, you know, put out there. And basically, Seamus Blackley, who is basically, I think they often attribute him. I don't know. They often, you know, he's basically been around for a while. It's his baby, you know, back in the day in the original one. And so he basically put out a tweet telling everybody, hey, I don't think anybody's discovered this yet and said, hey, here's how you do it. And, you know, I guarantee you there's probably other stuff that's just hidden that nobody else has found. I mean, developers are notorious for hiding their watermarks in stuff uh you know they you know all whether it's hardware marking with mario characters or whoever on the chipsets and the boards they're notorious for doing this and the software ones are even harder to find because you gotta do just like this one who would have ever went and done all these steps and happened to name their their new rip timmy with a bunch of y's and an exclamation point the exact number of y's you would need so uh it's kind of funny that this was there and you know and and i I don't know how anybody would have ever guessed that unless they somehow were able to unpack the hidden menu beforehand and backtracked it on how you actually unlocked it the normal way. Uh, you know, there's always some type of hidden Easter eggs. And so it's just great when a new one comes out, especially when, you know, the, uh, the acclaimed father of Xbox reveals it himself, you know? <laughs> so. Right. 
Well, I mean, the Xbox has had this before, you know, with like you were talking about with, uh, uh, you know, on the chipset itself. You know, they had the Master Chief riding the Scorpion, right, for the Xbox uh, One X. You know that <laughs> they had that on the on the board, and then uh, I think the Xbox Series X has something similar to that. You know, or even on the Xbox Series X, you know, if you turn it upside down, the uh, I think I, I can't remember. I think you had to take the plate off at the bottom. Well, the plate doesn't come off, but there. There's a well, it doesn't turn or something, but if you remove the plate or on the plate itself, I can't remember. It says, you know, uh, uh, you know, hello from Seattle or whatever, you know, kind of like we've seen before with Xbox, but it's mm-hmm. also on the Series X uh, under that plate that it sits on, um, yeah. either under it or on top of it. I can't remember, but anyway, it, that's in there. And then, you know, so Xbox is notorious, especially them, you know, Microsoft is notorious with their Xboxes to put like these special sayings or, you know, special little things in there that, you know, just kind of are kind of hidden, you know, some are hidden more than not. But, you know, that's really cool. It's really cool to see that type of stuff. And uh, it's really cool to see developers put stuff like in that because it's really exciting to see. I mean, even though it's a credits roll, it's still exciting to see, like, just this Easter egg that's been there the whole time that no one's even, you know, figured out or anything like that. But like you said, unless they take the dashboard and kind of just break it apart, you know, kind of roll it back over from the back to the front of it. You know, there, there'd be no way for anybody to figure that stuff out. So, but it's still a cool yep. thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it lets the developers add their own little personal touch, you know, or maybe a nostalgic touch because it's, you know, master chief riding a scorpion. That's kind of a nostalgia touch a little. <laughs> so they just do weird stuff. And yeah, I mean, Xbox is notorious for hiding, Hello from Seattle all over the place. I mean, they've done it under controller batteries. And as Nick said on the Series X, if you flip it over, you can see it on the base, the little swivel base that it's on. So they they have a they have a they, they they're known to hide little things in different places, you know, the little master chiefs just wherever in little little random places. So it's kind of great to see that stuff. And then in their little software, they even give their software developers uh it sounds like free reign to add these little hidden Easter eggs and stuff like that. You know, they're all fun, harmless little things and they're great little tidbits of info for the fans and, and lets the developers have a little remembering mark for their team. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, this is a really cool thing. You know, I'd like to see more of that, you know, and I'd like to see more of that from the other developers as well to do little things like that. And we really don't, when we hear about these Easter eggs and stuff, we typically hear about Microsoft and Xbox. We don't hear a ton about PlayStation or Nintendo as far as these little Easter eggs and stuff. So it would be cool to see them kind of incorporate that stuff into their, into their things. I mean, I guess the, the newest thing is that, you know, the PlayStation controller for PlayStation 5 has the little uh, symbols all over the controller, like textualized. If you zoom in real close or look real close to it. So that's really cool, right. you know. But, uh, you know, wish... I guess Xbox really couldn't do that because it'd just be a bunch of X's, but still. Um, <laughs> but that's really cool. Anywho, let's move on to the next one. Zelda Skyward Sword. So Skyward Sword is coming out on the Switch. It was originally a Wii title, I believe, or Wii U title. I think it was a Wii title. Um, it's coming back out, re-releasing on the Nintendo Switch uh, here in July, I believe. Now, from my understanding, I never played Skyward Sword but from my understanding, there's no fast travel in Skyward Sword. And that was kind of one of the complaints. There was many complaints. It was pretty much, from my understanding, Skyward Sword was one of the lowest ranking or rated, I should say, uh, fan-wise uh, X or uh, Zelda games, right? Uh, I never played Skyward Sword. Um, but apparently one of the things, one of the problems in the game, besides many others, is that you couldn't fast travel. There was no way to fast travel around the, the map and stuff. So in this game, they do have a fast travel option. Unfortunately, though, it seems to be locked behind an amiibo. So there's an amiibo coming out with the game. The amiibo looks really cool. It's got Zelda with uh, one of the flying pelicans or birds or whatever they are. Uh, it's one of their bigger amiibos. So it's not one of the small ones that we're used to seeing. It's a little bit bigger. Uh, but apparently you have to buy, and it's, going to be $25 from my understanding. So you have to buy this $25 Amiibo in order to fast travel in the game. That's the only way to fast travel. There's no other no other way to fast travel in the game without having the Amiibo. If you don't have it, you cannot fast travel, which apparently, you know, a lot of people are kind of bummed out or mad about. And I can understand that, you know, putting in a feature that the game desperately needed, apparently, 
uh, the ability to fast travel and then locking it behind a $25 Amiibo. Not everybody buys or collects Amiibos, you know, and maybe some people, you know, and there's some people that do buy Amiibos like myself. I do buy some and I usually buy the ones that I like, uh, but typically I keep them in the package. You know, I don't take them out. I just kind of use them as display to display on the wall and stuff like that because the figurines are cool looking, but, you know, I don't like to take them out and use them. So that would be, you know, if I bought this one, it'd be the same. <laughs> it'd be the same for that. You know, I wouldn't want to take it out of the box, but um, I don't know how, like, like I said, I haven't ever played Skyward Swords. So I don't know how big of a deal it is, but, you know, Zelda's, every Zelda's kind of had a, well, the newer three ones have always had kind of a fast travel. You think of Ocarina of Time, you know, you could use the Ocarina to kind of fast travel to different locations and stuff, you know, playing different songs. So, you know, that, that, that's kind of crappy for Nintendo to stick the fast travel option behind a $25 Amiibo purchase. Uh, what do you think about this, Pat? So, here, I mean, I don't like that they've done this. And here's why it's a huge deal. In Skyward Sword, you know, the world split into two. The up, the, you know, the up in the sky where you can fly around on your, on your um, loft wing. And then the, and it's open, just fly. There's usually not anything that's going to hurt you up there. And then you have the, ground world which is kind of littered with the enemies and stuff so moving f- across the world from one point to the other is always a pain and the only way to get into the sky uh the sky world you know up into the sky was you had to go to a statue to call your uh to call the, the loft wing and, and you would go into the sky so the amiibo allows you to call the loft wing wherever you want basically so and that to me i mean so they're adding a feature behind another purchase. So I, I'm kind of against that. So if I want the ease of use of calling my loft wing anywhere I want, then I have to pay the extra $25. So on top of a $60 game, I'm now spending $25 more, which means I'm spending $85 to be able to have a little bit of an ease of travel in the game. Um, a lot of people complained uh, back in the day about that. You know, that, you know, I have to run all the way over here to the statue to use my loft wing. And I've not, you know, I've not seen what it's going to be like in the new one. But from what I understand, you can call the loft wing anywhere you want now, even in a dungeon. So that's kind of weird. And it'll just take you immediately flying in the sky. So, yeah, I. It, but you have to have the amiibo to do it. Right, exactly. You have to have the amiibo to do it, yeah. the amiibo to do it. So right now you can't do that unless you want to spend the extra twenty five dollars. And and like Nick said, I don't buy a lot of amiibos and any of them that I do normally buy, I buy them. So they're. uh left in the box, you know, as a collector's item and not like to put on my controller to do something. So, um, I think it's just going to cause a little bit more pirating of the Amiibo codes and somebody's going to put them on near, on the near field swipe card so they can just swipe their controller for it. I mean, it, it, it's not, I don't like this at all. It's basically giving, I mean, it's a single player game, but it's giving you a, a huge added benefit to completing the game quicker or getting to where you want to quicker by giving them an extra $25. Uh, and I'm totally against that. If I, I'm okay with giving characters in a game, cosmetic items and stuff like that, but this is not cosmetic. It actually alters gameplay. So you shouldn't do alter gameplay for people who want to pay more money. And I mean, it's, it's nothing new to Nintendo. I mean, every game does it. If you pre-order the deluxe version of our game, we'll give you these starting items that help you out, you know, but it's not usually in games like, um, where there's not really levels involved. I mean, it is RPG. You do skill up and stuff like that, like everything else, but it's not like um, Outriders or something where you're gaining levels and the, the starting items they give you, get you get rid of in like 15 levels or 10 levels. This is an item that you will use from the beginning of the game to the end of the game to finish the game quicker or to basically get out of danger or just be able to traverse the map quicker. I'm not okay with that. It's It's bad tactics. If you wanted that to be an ability in the game, you should have just given it to everybody. But Nintendo is pushing hard on their Amiibos, man. They, you know, everything for the Switch and is trying to go Amiibo. I mean, Starlink and all that stuff, build better ships, get the Starlink pieces. And so I'm I'm anti that. I mean, if I want to buy little figurines, I buy them for collectors. I don't want to buy them to put them on my controller and pull them out of the box. So I'm I'm very much against it. They need to fit. You need to figure out a bigger, better plan to make money than what Nintendo does on this one. Yeah. And this opens the floodgates. I feel like this opens the floodgates if this goes successfully for Nintendo, for them to start locking, you know, because I think other Amiibos before always just locked behind like 
cosmetic items and various things like that. And that's fine. Okay, cool. You know, if someone wants to buy an Amiibo to maybe in Mario unlock an extra life or something or a different outfit, then that's fine. But, you know, if this goes off without a hitch for Nintendo, they're going to look, they could potentially look at using the Amiibo to unlock, like you said, you know, I mean, this is a feature for the game. They could use that to unlock other features for the games, right? Like another stage, another level, another campaign mission uh you know they could ubisoft it right <laughs> where they got the all this stuff it's like dlc but in an amiibo right you know what i'm saying so i mean they could unlock uh, special weapons and characters and stages and you know maybe another two hours of gameplay on a game locked behind an, ami- an amiibo and so yeah that 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 becomes a problem at that point right you know the amiibos are cool but I think a lot of people collect them not to really use them in game. I mean, I have to, you know, so I do have some Amiibos and, you know, looking at some games that utilize Amiibos, half the features that they give you for utilizing Amiibo, I don't really care about. Like, it's just a, a costume or some little accessory or something or something stupid. I'm just like, eh, whatever. But in this one, you know, that would make me think twice. Like, do I want this feature? You know, I didn't, like I said, I haven't played Skyward Sword, but like, it sounds like it's, um, kind of a pain to find these statues to go to your loft wing. So, you know, uh, is it going to be a problem? You know, is it going to be a problem for those people that they have, is it going to make it to where you feel like, I mean, I guess you can play and beat the game without it because the original was like that, but is this going to be too much of a convenience that people feel like they have to buy the Amiibo with it? Right. And then you're selling this game. Plus Nintendo is bad about this as well. You know, they're going to sell Skyward Sword at $60, even though it's just a not really a remake. They probably didn't change anything in it or very little, maybe made it HD, but that's about it, because that's pretty much how Nintendo looks at their remakes. And you're going to, you know, charge you 60 bucks, then $25 on top of that for this Amiibo. So, you know, Nintendo, besides this locking it behind an Amiibo, Nintendo's got a lot of big problems with their remakes where, um, the re-releases, I should say, um, where they need to reduce the price of those re-releases. But I mean, Nintendo is a popular company. So people go out and buy that re-release of the game that just came out, you know, two years ago on the Wii or the Wii U, you know, the Wii, they're releasing a lot of Wii U games because those weren't very popular. And the Wii U itself wasn't very popular. So all those great games that did come out on the Wii U, now they're re-releasing them on the Switch. So they're just kind of double dipping in that sense. Um, right. So, yeah, I just hope it doesn't end up being some sort of trend for Nintendo. I mean, it, they're always been that way. I mean, the Amiibo has always unlocked something that you can't get in game without an Amiibo. I mean, Breath of the Wild, I mean, was where was where I first really got into Amiibos. And I was like, you're telling me that I can't get this sword or this armor unless I buy an Amiibo? What kind of crap is that? And granted, they're not always the best sets of anything. So whatever, you know, but. If I really want that wolf companion in Breath of the Wild, guess what? I have to I have to buy the amiibo. Now, in my opinion, the wolf and things like that are a pain in the butt in amiibos because every time you want to call, you have to swipe the amiibo, and it's like I'm done with this thing, whatever you know. Uh, but you get chests and gold and all kinds of crap and weapons, you know. So it's it's their loot box system, if you will. I mean. Ultimately, I mean, because Nintendo games don't have a lot of loot boxes, you know, they're not notoriously. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be playing Call of Duty on a <laughs> on a Switch and stuff, you know, not at least the latest version. But that's their loot box system. That's how they're sucking money out of players. You know, that's their cosmetic loot. So however they're going to make it work, this is how they're going to make it work. They're like, hey, you get a cool figurine for 15 or $25 and it does something for your game. So not only are they getting the $60 for the game, but however many Amiibos you purchase and however many, you know, the 15 versus the 25. And this one's going to be 25, which is, I mean, it's bigger than the rest and it's Zelda and her, her uh, left wing, left wing. And then, you know, okay, cool. But I don't want to pay you an extra 25 bucks so I can pop on my, my loft wing quicker, you know? (laughs) Right. Yeah, so we'll see how it goes with them. You know, I mean, clearly this is coming out, and it's and you know, Nintendo's not going to change their mind about it. So it's it is going to be what it is. But um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with Amiibos in the future. You know, what they decide to lock behind them. Um, 
you know, because like you said, you know, the, the sword and shield and, and the and the wolf companion, you know, I I don't know. I feel like for some reason I feel like um fast travel is more convenient than the sword and shield and the wolf companion. Like I feel like that's a feature that should be in the game, right? Like this wolf companion in Breath of the Wild or the Sword and Shield or whatever it is, like they don't necessarily have to be there. I mean, there's a variety of stuff in the game, so that's fine. But this is a feature, right? It's almost like playing an MMO, and in order to get unlock that second hot bar, you have to buy the amiibo, right? <laughs> and it's like, no, you need several hot bars in MMOs. You know, that's the whole point. We're not going to EA Star Wars the Old Republic it here, right? Exactly. That's what I was getting ready to say. There's Star Wars the Old Republic in it. You need that extra hot bar. Right. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do with it uh, in the future. But, oh, well, Nintendo's going to Nintendo. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to our last story. Starfield, the uh, Elder Scrollish Fallout-ish game by Bethesda, their new IP, kind of in the same vein from our from our understanding as kind of like the Elder Scrolls in, in Fallout in that kind of first person uh, open world adventure. Uh, but set in space. So, you know, Bethesda was purchased by Microsoft uh, not too long ago. And so the thought was, you know, what's going to happen with these games that come out like Elder Scrolls 6 and Starfield and stuff like that, since now they're owned by Microsoft. Well, uh, Jason Stry- uh, Stryer from Kotaku has uh, put out that, uh, or has confirmed from his, from the information he's gotten that Starfield will be an Xbox slash PC exclusive. So even though we don't have official confirmation from X from Microsoft that it is going to be an Xbox PC exclusive, uh, you know, Jason Stryer has pretty good information saying that it will be an uh, exclusive to that. And, and, you know, he's pretty most of the time on the point uh, with these types of rumors and stuff like that, which now, I mean, I understand one thing or the other, but, you know, you know, some people were wondering, like, you know, is Xbox or Microsoft going to do this? Are they are they going to make these games from Bethesda, from Bethesda exclusive to their own consoles? And I say, well, I mean, why wouldn't they? Right. I mean, why wouldn't they? If Sony bought Bethesda, they ain't going to bring Starfield or Elder Scrolls six out on the Xbox. I can tell you that right now. Sony's not, not that type of company. Microsoft is more that type of company where they could potentially do something like that. But Sony's definitely not that type of company. So if it was the other way around, I could tell you definitively that that game would be exclusive to the PlayStation and that's it. Um, so, I mean, why not? Why not? If you're going to spend all that money, what was it, like $6.9 billion or something like that to buy Bethesda or however expensive it was? Why not all the games they make, make them exclusive to your console and the PC, right? And And... You know, when you spent all that money, why spend it all if you're going to just throw it on every platform? Might as well just keep them third party at that point. So, you know, I, I don't see why Microsoft would take the time to put that out on a, a, the Sony PlayStation or anything. But what do, what do you think about that, Pat? I would agree with you. I mean, uh, Sony on uh, studios or games that they build, they exclusively keep them to themselves and they don't ever release them on Xbox. I mean, let's let's talk about their greatest hits, you know, like I mean, you know, I guess it, I guess it would depend on the studio, right? I mean, we got God of War, you got Horizon. You've got quite a few games, you know, the the Spider-Man games, the quite a few games that are them theirs alone and they're not going to share. Microsoft's not quite as 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 strict as they are, I should say, because I mean, PlayStation has a hu- a larger chunk of exclusives. I mean, and it's just the way that they do. Microsoft's pretty much just like, hey, you want to play it? We're going to put it out. You can play it on whatever you got because we want to make more money. Uh, you know, and, and as you said, Jason Trier has said that it's going to be uh, an exclusive and it's going to be in 2022 that it's going to come out. And so it hasn't been collaborated, collaborated by Microsoft yet. So it could change. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if it was one way or the other, knowing Microsoft, who knows what they've got up their sleeves. I mean, the latest Xbox Series X doesn't have a whole lot of exclusives, and I don't necessarily think Microsoft cares at that point because they have a plan, and their plan revolves around uh, games as a service or Game Pass and stuff like that. That's how they're making their money. They're you know buying studios that make games like Bethesda. That's just more money for them, and it makes more sense to make your game available to more people. If I log my games into exclusively Xbox, which they'll never do, 
because they're Microsoft. They're going to say it's Xbox and Windows. But if I lock out a whole group like PlayStation, which which historically has sold more consoles than Microsoft by a long shot sometimes, they're they're losing all that money. And Microsoft's not a dumb company. They're not going to be like, well, we'd rather lose the money than than, you know, we'd rather lose the money than to release it for the masses. So I don't, you know, Microsoft's never been that way. And I don't, you know, they may make this an exclusive game. It may be a timed exclusive. Who knows? But Microsoft keeps, Microsoft releases even the Microsoft Studios stuff for everything a lot of times. Um, but we'll see what time has to say with Starfield. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's funny because we have seen very little about Starfield, but I'm super excited to see the game because I know it's Bethesda and it's going to be Bethesda in space. So come on, sign me up. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I don't know. I think Microsoft will keep this exclusive to their Xbox and PC ecosystem. Um, I just don't see them putting it on a PlayStation. And, and the main reason why I don't think so, and I understand what you're saying, like, you know, they are going to lose those potential buyers. But, you know, I don't know. Sony is really bad. Well, not really bad, but they don't play ball with anybody else. Right. And so I almost, it's kind of like twofold. You know, I feel like, okay, yeah, you got those players over there that they could potentially dip into. But on the other sense, Sony doesn't play ball with any other developers or any other companies, right? Microsoft, Nintendo, things like that. So why give them a leg up? You know, why throw them a bone when they don't do anything for you, right? They they they, bet they don't do, you know, they, they're really strict on cross-play. You know, their their games don't, and then their games are finally starting to come to Windows PC. So maybe they're maybe they're turning that kind of around for themselves, where they're going to kind of broaden their games out to, you know, their exclusives. I mean, Days Gone just came out on Steam, right? Uh, Horizon came out a few months ago or whatever on on Steam, um, and I think some other uh, PlayStation exclusives have come out on Steam or going to. So, um, I think if you know, for, I don't know. I think if Sony were playing ball a little bit more with the rest of the the developers, Nintendo and and Microsoft, Microsoft might look at putting those games out there for them uh, on their machine, right? Otherwise, since they don't, they could be looking at it like, you know, again, why should we throw you a bone when you know you don't you won't play ball with the rest of the stuff that, that the rest of the gaming community is trying to do with crossplay and various things like that. So. It'll be interesting. You know, it might start out exclusive, right? Uh, like you said, and then eventually come to PlayStation. It may start out where, play, you know, Microsoft, the first few titles from Bethesda become, are just Xbox and PCs exclusives. And down the road, they do start putting those out on PlayStation as well. So it'll be interesting to see. But, you know, then again, you know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Xbox is more open, you know, and, and they really want to sell you Game Pass. So. I mean, that's really your best value all in all. You know, all these games, these Bethesda games, which are great games, are all going to come to Game Pass day and date. So that's just, you know. But ultimately, yep. for us gamers, you know, for me and you and the rest of the podcast, and we, we like all develop, all all platforms. So for us, yep. we don't really care what it comes out on because we're going to own them all. <laughs> we have a variety to choose from. But 